is the head of the largest medical research center in the world, and he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the National Medal of Science. And to put his role in perspective, if that isn't enough, he's Dr. Anthony Fauci's boss. And we're talking about Dr. Francis Collins, director of the National Institutes of Health. Good morning to you. And good morning, Maggie, and hello, Oklahoma City. We're so glad to have you with us this morning. Let's just jump right in and talk about this. So in Sweden, they were hit very hard uh, the last month, but over the last 30 days, they have seen a steady drop in cases and they never had a lockdown. And their ch uh, chief epidemiologist had even suggested they no longer need to wear masks on, to ride public transportation. Looking at the numbers, they are very far away from the consensus numbers they would need for herd immunity. Is it possible that herd immunity could be achieved at lower levels, or do you think there's another explanation there? Well, Sweden has certainly been an interesting outlier experiment uh, in terms of how they've decided to address this. And I think it is worthy of note that they didn't undertake a lot of lockdown efforts when other parts of Europe and uh, other parts of the world were doing so. And they did have a terrible spike in cases as a result. And their epidemiologist for a while was saying, I guess I made a big mistake. Exactly what's going on now, I'm not quite sure I can explain it, but all of the models we have from this disease and other diseases says, unless you get about 70 to 80% of the population immunized against an infection, you don't really have herd immunity. There are just too many people who can still get infected and spread the virus around. We're a long way from that, and they are too. You know, school is starting in the coming weeks around the country. What are your recommendations for families? I recognize, and we all do, that school is really important for kids, both the educational opportunities, the opportunities to socialize with your peers. All of this ought to be a part of a child's opportunity to grow and develop. At the same time, you don't want to do that in a fashion that's putting people at undue risk. I think the answer really has to be a local one. If you're in a part of the country where there's very little virus spreading, it might make sense to open up carefully, of course, and keep a close, close track on what's happening. But if you're in the middle of a place where the virus is spreading actively, and you have all kinds of ways of showing that's the case, to open schools without considering the risks doesn't seem like a particularly smart thing to do, especially when you consider what the risks are to teachers. People are concerned that, well, you know, maybe children don't acquire the disease or spread it that much. That really isn't something to count on. If you saw the recent report of a camp in Georgia where uh, basically all of the kids and the uh, counselors got exposed and about 60% of them got infected, this is clearly a virus that's quite good at spreading in closed spaces with kids and adults. When we look at the numbers and we look at numbers of cases, then numbers of hospitalizations, are both of those numbers just vitally important? A lot of times when we share case numbers here, people will say, well, how many people are in the hospital? Don't just tell me the case numbers. Can you talk about that and, and the importance of tracking the numbers in those ways? It's really a good point. We need to look at all of those measures of what's happening. Every morning, I look at what's happened across the country in terms of new cases, but then I look at hospitalizations, and then I sadly have to look at deaths. And you can see how in the course of the last month or two, what happened first was an uptick in cases, which had been down around 20,000 or so a day, and then crept up bit by bit all the way to like 70,000. And at first, it didn't look as if there was going to be that much of a consequence. The hospitalizations were a little slower going up, but then they started to. And now, sadly, in the last 10 days, 14 days, the number of deaths, which had been down in a few hundred, went up above 1,000. So you can see all this happening. All of those numbers need to be looked at by anybody who's thinking about where to go, making decisions about their own local community. What role do genetics play in this virus and how a person will be impacted? We've seen people be asymptomatic all the way to nearly losing their life and then losing their life. Talk about genetics. What well, we know, as you just said, there's enormous variability in terms of how people deal with this infection. Part of that is understandable on the basis of chronic illness, but if you look at people who otherwise seem very similar to each other, they don't always have the same outcome. Some of that probably is genetics, and already there's a study that suggests that your blood group has something to do with your risk of getting really sick. 
people with A-type blood are more likely to get in trouble than people with O-type blood. It's not a terribly strong effect, but it looks real. And there's some other places uh, in the genome that appear to have variations that play some role that we don't quite understand yet. It's early days yet to look at that. I don't think, though, you'd want to take that to the point of having everybody tested and say, okay, well, this person can just, you know, not worry too much because their genetics is going to protect them. It won't be that good. It'll be a matter of degree. Are you really susceptible or less susceptible? We're all susceptible. In certain viral infections, there's a risk of a phenomenon called antibody-dependent enhancement. Can you just talk about what that is and then how it might relate to COVID-19? Maggie, you're asking great questions. These are really down into the science, and I appreciate that a lot. Uh, it has been described, but rarely, uh, where a vaccine can actually somehow uh, miswire the immune system so that a subsequent exposure to the virus ends up with a more serious case instead of a less serious case. Uh, that happened with a vaccine against something called RSV. It happened with a vaccine against dengue. That's about the only times we've actually seen evidence of this. We think we understand how, how that can happen and we are doing everything possible with the vaccines against COVID-19 to avoid that. But that's another reason to do the phase three trials that are just getting started within the last week to watch very closely with tens of thousands of people. Is there any indication of something like this happening, which would be a reason to stop that vaccine right then? And speaking of a vaccine, how many people need to be vaccinated to stop the spread of the virus? If we don't reach those levels, what will Americans need to do over the coming months and years? Well, first of all, the phase three trials are geared to uh, accept about 30,000 volunteers for each of the six or seven vaccines that are going to be tested starting right now. And you want to have that number of people so that you'll be able to say for sure whether it worked and whether it was safe. During this time, though, and that's going to spread over the next uh, five or six months, probably till the end of 2020, uh, people should continue to practice all of those public health measures that we've been hearing about, but unfortunately not all sticking to wearing a mask when you're outside. Uh, from your home, um, avoiding gathering in crowded indoor spaces, keeping that six foot distance. I know people are tired of that. It's hot weather, the wet, maybe the mask doesn't feel so good, but think about this the way you would a seatbelt. It's just good public health measures. And to the degree that people relax on that, they're putting other people at risk. I'm talking to young people here particularly who may feel like they're fairly invulnerable because they don't usually get that sick if they get COVID-19, but they can spread it and they are spreading it. And that's why we're having such trouble now in certain parts of the country. This is up to all of us. And until the end of the year, when we hope a vaccine will become available, and I'm cautiously optimistic about that, there's really no substitute for doing these simple measures that depend on every American. Dr. Francis Collins, we thank you so very much for your time on this Monday morning. Go to coronavirus.gov if you want to learn more and sign up for the vaccine trial. Doctor, thank you so very much. <laughs>